is for you. Okay. All right. So um, this is my talk that's largely based on liftoff. I don't know how many people here are familiar with liftoff. Maybe show of hands if you're familiar with liftoff. Wow. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like a little bit bigger of a introduction to what led me to write liftoff, uh, which is a lifting program, but also a book that sort of explains why you would do a lifting program. And um, yeah, so I think this is explanatory. There's a little bit of disordered eating talk in here. So hopefully everyone is like at peace with that. Um, and we can just get going. So this is, there we go. Okay. So this is my beautiful couch to barbell slide. If you're interested in the book, I'll display this again at the end, but it's for sale at that website, only that website. It's not on Amazon. It's not on Barnes and Noble. It's like just me and my website. <laughs> so if you're interested in it, um, please check it out at some point today, whenever, whenever you feel like it. Okay. So I'm like, where are all my notes? Um, hold on. I'm missing some content here. <laughs> Hopefully this explains, this is self-explanatory. Um, I wanted to first get a show of hands. How many people here into running? How many of you enjoy running? Okay, same number enjoy as, as do it. That's good. I like to hear, hear and see that. Okay, so um, I was into running for several years. Um, my relationship with running was that I hated running, but I didn't, it was sort of the exercise that I hated the least. Um, so I knew that my purpose in life was to do three things, uh, to be as small as possible, to eat as little as possible and to burn calories and running was like the way to do that. Um, so what you do, this, <laughs> the purpose of this slide is that my purpose in life as a woman felt like going from being big and sad to being small and happy to going from crying into a pint of ice cream to laughing alone with salad. Um, and that was kind of how I understood my relationship with exercise, my relationship with my body and with food. Um, I was curious if anyone here knows this is a rhetorical question no hands for this but i was i'm i've been taken with this fact that i learned recently that being too to cal being too calorie deprived makes you um, very rigid about rules following rules such as diet rules we'll get a, a little more into that in a second but um so this is my personal trajectory i have the photo on the right you know that it ends well but, uh, i started trying to lose weight in about 2009 uh, by 2013, I was down to 138 pounds. And that probably doesn't sound like that small, but I put everything I had <laughs> to being 138 pounds. Um, I was running half marathons. I fought every day to not eat more than 1,500 calories. And I thought if I could just get it right with all of these things at some point, I would start feeling okay about my body and like I wouldn't have to think about food so much. And uh, that I would not stop being scared to like eat spaghetti. Um, but I was wrong. And um, metrically, I think it seemed like I was doing great I was running half marathons. Um, but I didn't know this at the time. I never felt worse in my entire life. Um, and another fact that I sort of thought of as I was making this talk is the idea that it's not as impressive to just be skinny forever as it is to sort of just have lost weight. It's like that expression of it's hell writing, not writing. The perfect mode is just having it. The best way to be as a woman is to have just lost like 10, 20 pounds. Um, so keep that, keep that also in mind because we're going to come back to that. Um, so I didn't invent this stuff my cat's laser pointer. Um, so these are all, what do I specifically have to point here to? Um, I got this photo from Twitter. I couldn't believe this, this like sort of 
extremely forensic comparison of two women's bodies, the way that dress fits them. Um, this was just sort of like all of the culture that we grew up in in, in, in like the mid nineties to the late two thousands, I would say, where we had beauty standards that weren't just our job, but like our purpose in life. And it was like girl bosses do juice cleanses and it's girl power to eat good vegetables and like avoid bad foods. And there were so many teen magazines that were like frowny face, a serving of Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia has 310 calories. Like, why would you eat that? It's so sad. Um, I, let me see, what was the date on this? Lindsay Lohan covered June, 2004. So I was like a, what was I? I think I was just finishing my junior year in high school at this time. It's just like, look at this. 435 ways to be naturally beautiful. A bikini body workout for like someone, like no one over 17 is reading this magazine. So it's like, what are you saying to teens? Like, I guess I was reading it at 17, but like, and then you have this sort of juxtaposition of guys confessing what makes them cheat with all of this other stuff. And it's like, why would they cheat? Because you only know 423 ways to be naturally beautiful? Maybe. this. I mean, this is similar. So we have South Beach Diet. <laughs> lose, I don't know if you can see it, but it says lose seven pounds fast. I think peel off seven pounds fast. And then all of this other stuff that's just like how to please guys. It's just like all pleasing, pleasing men, pleasing men. Um, I actually forgot about this recently, but does anyone remember the master cleanse? This was like an OG Gwyneth Paltrow, non-gift to the world. Um, <laughs> And I remember, so this was around this time, like 2008, I a girl I know doing this. And on day two, she was blogging about it on like, floor, I think. <laughs> and on day two, I remember her writing that she would, it was something like crawl over broken glass for the barbecue sauce under some guy's fingernails. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> but that was like, not just like, I don't know if it was me but that just didn't seem like that crazy of a thing to say. It was just like, oh, cravings. Like having, having this relationship with like never being too thin was just so, so normalized. And I, when I think back at this time, I'm kind of like in the brain. It's almost like I gaslight myself about how bad it was. But when I look at these magazine covers, I'm just like, I didn't imagine any part of this. This is a new water bottle from the library, very generously. But like, I'm very bad at drinking out of water bottles, so if I spill it all over myself, it's, that's a normal day for me. Um, and things haven't gotten any better. I almost feel worse for teens today because it's like, you could at least look up the editor-in-chief of this magazine and be like, who did this? Or who's responsible anyway? It's like, when you have something trending on TikTok and you have like thousands of women being like my hormone, my workout to balance my hormones. You're like, thousand, your, your brain is not designed to process thousands of people saying something and like question whether it's true. And we have, I don't know if anyone remembers, uh, nature cereal from a couple of years ago that was berries and ice water. Um, this was, uh, there's plenty of like how to lose 10 pounds in a week. Chloe Ting, two week abs. It's like, just like there we have, we do have all of the body positivity and the body neutrality, but it's like, there's so much that hasn't changed, changed in a, in a way it's more insane because it has the sort of groundswell feeling to it instead of being so top down. And I think that's bad in its own way. Um, okay. So coming back to a couple of things I said, I wanted to talk quickly about the, I didn't actually know this was called the biology of human starvation, this study, but it's commonly known as the Minnesota starvation experiment, which I, I guess wrote there. Um, and this guy, what's his name? Ansel Keys and his uh, scientist friends wanted to do research on the effects of basically being in a concentration camp uh, in terms of feeding people. Um, and they didn't know that what they were ultimately going to end up speaking to 75 some years later was like the average reader 
grown, the grown reader of the 2017 magazine. Um, so really quickly, just want to read this quote that is from a book called Sick Enough by Jennifer Bagani. That's a few years old, but it's like extremely good if you've never heard of it. Starvation often makes a person more rigid and fearful, more rigid, fearful, and anxious with difficulty falling asleep. In the 1940s, a landmark study was the first to document the symptoms of a starving brain. A physiologist gathered 36 young men at the University of Minnesota to study how prisoners of war and concentration camp captives would weather restricted calories. What was unexpected, though, was the psychological impact on these men. After a mere six month stretch of low calorie intake, high energy output, and substantial weight loss, the men almost universally reported high levels of depression and emotional distress. They scored high on symptoms of hysteria, which <laughs> they must have that's a woman's thing, and hypochondria. And some of the men began self harming. They felt preoccupied with food both during the starvation and rehabilitation phases and reported viewing others who ate normally with a fascinated, judgmental disgust. As they became socially withdrawn and isolated, they felt like the concentration and judgment were impaired. Sound familiar? I'm just like, I mean, this explains so much why some people get kind of fight or flight when you get too close to them with a piece of bread and butter. It's like, this is a mentality that is born specifically of disordered eating and sort of chronic dieting for a really long time. Um, and this institutionalized starvation in women's magazines, as we just saw, I guess now, broader popular culture, social media, uh, well, not social media for me, but that all defined my relationship with working out and food in myself. And I didn't know any other sort of orienting force for this stuff other than like, trying to lose weight. Uh, I thought I had to do it for health and I had to do it for acceptance, and I didn't know there was any other option <laughs> other than that sort of driving factor. But this was not only kind of hemming me in in the way this is, like this really resonates with me from the time that I was affected. Um, it was scientifically self-defeating in ways that I didn't understand. And I didn't know how actually impossible it was, not just in terms of like the ideology of it could never be too thin because no one can, but the fact that it was specifically undermining the process of dieting, like undermined itself just by virtue of how biology works. Um, we're gonna get into that in a second. But um, so here we have Hilary Duff who recently, yeah, this was like in December, so it was only a few months ago, um, sort of told her story recently of how badly she got into it with disordered eating back. This was like roughly in the era of the magazine covers that I just showed. So, uh, and juxtaposed with some of my social media heroes. This is Stephanie Sanzo and Jessica Buter, Tamara Walcott, if you follow them, you should. But um, so I'm showing them because following statements are facts. When you have a solid base of muscle mass, not like a steroid amount, but just like a basic livelihood blend amount. Um, the amount, just like the amount that you lose by dieting too much. Uh, more muscle mass is correlated with being uh, more sort of mentally aware, smarter, less mentally unwell, you have more energy, you're more confident in yourself to eat food, metabolic, un, metabolically speaking. Uh, your body just needs it. So your diet can be more balanced and well-rounded. So what do we do? When we keep this out of the hands of women, that is what we do. Make them think the image on the left is good, the images on the right are bad. We can't subjugate a whole swath of people if they're at peace in their right minds. Um, it's probably the single most dangerous thing you can have as a woman physically, just a little bit of muscle waving a wind around in society. Um, this is why uh, the aggressive chronic dieting push being destructive to muscle mass makes me so mad. So what do I mean by that? Uh, a few years ago, I came up with this way of talking about the concept of muscle mass and body fat, body composition, with the avocado diagrams. Um, I'm a millennial, I think, in terms of avocados. If you want, speak to us. You can put it 
in avocado terms. Um, if you say unionizing leverages the value of labor, we're like, what the fuck is that? If you say your boss is like avocado seed, but you're the avocado meat, we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so this is a sort of extremely simplified visualization of what weight loss entities want you to think is happening. You lose weight when you go from a higher body weight to a lower body weight, you just, you know, big, fat, small, and happy. And that's what a lot of their numbers are based on body weight, BMI, like waist, 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 are sort of all oriented around this, like getting smaller is like uncomplicated, not just in getting the results, but in the feelings that um, but in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that. Or it's not, it's not complicated. But um, so what they are missing from the picture is that our bodies are not just like one mass of weighs a certain number of pounds. We are body fat and we are muscle. And usually when we lose weight, especially through the types of dieting that are most popular, Losing both body fat and muscle in kind of one scoop here. Um, up to half of your weight loss can be muscle if you're really hard about dieting. And that is its own problem, but it can sort of compound over many cycles of dieting. So if you're yo yo dieting, you kind of lose some of your muscle. As we know, most diets don't work and you gain your weight back because you have like, you're not paying any particular attention to the muscle concept here. A lot of the weight you back is fat and just sort of over several steps in this process, you're exchanging your muscle for body fat, you end up the same size, maybe you're the same weight, maybe both, but all of your muscle has been depleted by this like ultimately fruitless process of going on an aggressive diet. So this is the short version you go from as you can see, decent amount of muscle to no particular muscle. Um, so the thing about muscle is that you can get it back. It's not gone forever just because you lose it through dieting. Um, but when we think of building muscle, we think of huge bodybuilders, Jalen Hurts, who can squat, I think, 600 pounds or 700 pounds or something really crazy. He's very strong. Uh, the mountain from Game of Thrones, I think this is like 1,000 pounds. And I have Stephanie Sanzo here again. But just like we think that lifting, we're like, when we think of lifting, we say, oh, I don't want to do anything that intense. I'm like not any of these people. I don't need to do anything that's like that crazy. Um, but the thing is that it takes uh, years and years of effort and probably drugs to look like this, and also like just genetic potential. There's not millions of Arnolds running around. There's one Arnold. Um, so it's a kind of false concern, but we don't, we just like don't talk about lifting and strength training as much when it comes to not these people. We see it as something that's like, if you're like a really intense, already strong person, lifting weights is for you. If you're not, then it's, then you should do something sort of quote unquote less intense. That's wrong. <laughs> so we're going to get into what, how, what strength training looks like for someone who is not these people, and what can be sort of gained by that process if you have never done it before, which is still a valid situation in which to do it. So first, the related avocado diagrams to this: when you give yourself the right stimulus, as we call it, which would be strength training with heavy weights, you feed yourself, you're resting between workouts, you are able to build your muscle back. And in the case of someone who is new to lifting, you can actually lose body fat and gain muscle at the same time. That doesn't go on forever, but it's like for, for several months to a year, most people can take advantage of this like very glorious process where you don't have to really hone in too much on what it is that you're doing, your body just sort of like takes care of a lot of this process itself. It's actually like designed to reverse the effects of dieting too much. And you can kind of, this is just like that same yo-yo dieting uh, diagram, 
run backward. You kind of start from here. Once you do the recomposition process, you can continue to bulk and gain weight, shed body fat. I'm doing that right, this is the shedding body fat part. And go through that cycle until you can do it as long as you feel like it. You probably will hit a wall at some point of how much muscle you can really gain. But you're, this is like something that your body is designed to do and it's good at. And we're not really aware of it because we're not really thinking about our muscle at all. So I think I have a shorter. So just, this is just the shorter version of if you go through the muscle building process, you can go from having lost all of your muscle through whatever circumstances, sometimes through dieting, to building it back up. And this does not mean you are Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may honestly look exactly the same. And like, I think that I was not compelled by that idea early on, but what ended up doing it for me was that this feels completely different from this. When I was this, I felt very bad and I was cold all of the time. I had, um, I think, I think it's called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. You know what I'm talking about. And it was just, it was like a horrible existence, but I didn't really. And I was crazy. I just thought about myself. Being this, even though I don't think my size substantially changed, my relationship with food was completely different. I didn't think about it all the time. I moved and felt so much better. And it was just like, why would you be this? You could be this. And no one, no one kind of like gives us this opportunity. So, um, okay. So now I have some videos of what happens when you like do build this basic amount of strength. I need to just go here really quick. Um, hopefully this doesn't, all right. I'm just going to let it not play the music in case it's like a YouTube rights problem, but, um, so this is me shoveling snow in my backyard. Honestly, pretend to be bad at it, but um, this is sort of what lifting taught me is like correct form in these sort of like everyday ways that we move. And you wouldn't really think that lifting would come to bear in shoveling snow necessarily, but when it's heavy snow, you guys know about snow. This is, this is uh, just one of those things where you might even say like, I need to go to the gym more. I need to like be more fit. But lifting has like specific offerings here in terms of not just the, the raw strength, but the way that you move. Um, and then I had, this is the one that is on uh, the couch to barbell homepage. So if you ever wanna watch it again, it's right at the top there. But this is sort of a true story that I used to really struggle with <laughs> getting cat litter into the house because um, they come in 40 pound boxes. I never wanted to spend more money than what it costs to get, uh, you know, the bulk version of cat litter. And you wouldn't think again, picking something up could be that different. People would always say lift with your legs and not your back. And I was like, that doesn't sound possible, but lifting will teach you that your body can move in that way. And like, you don't need a particular skill in order to do it, you just need some practice. And it's like, we never give ourselves that chance. So with that, we'll go back to here and go, you think you're full screen. What's wrong here? Yeah, is it exit? There, no. Oh, it's this. That's what it is. <gasps> Hold on. I just need my notes. I'll fall apart. All right. <laughs> We're going to get there. Exit. Present first. There we go. I knew this would mess things up somehow. All right, full screen. All right, now we're back. Okay, so that's those videos. We can move on. Um, my mouse. Yeah. 
There we go. Okay. So let's briefly talk about what liftoff, which is liftoff capture part is the full term. I chose not to write it out there, I guess. But um, the broad strokes of it are it is three phases. It takes you from learning the body weight movements, the, the body weight versions of these lifting movements, to learning to do them with dumbbells, to learning to do them with a barbell. Uh, it's 12 weeks in total, three workouts a week, three movements per workout. It's like a grab bag of those five right there. And it is usually three sets per movement, five to eight reps per movement, occasionally a little more. And uh, that's it. Um, you don't know what any of these words are. That's what the liftoff book is for. Um, the book will teach you. That's what books do. Shout out to books. Um, so part of my problem in learning to lift was that I didn't really know what to do. I, um, I followed workouts that I found in women's magazines. And a lot of them were sort of like three sets of 20 crunches and planks and side bends. And they would call this strength training workout. And it would be like, the next day, your abs hurt so bad, you can laugh. And that I was like, why would I do that again? And that was like as far as I ever got with any strength training. When I found out about this style of programming, I was like, this feels like so different from anything that I've ever seen so crazy that maybe <laughs> it'll work, I guess. Um, but we'll go over some of, we don't have time to like go through all of the details of liftoff, obviously, but we're going to go through some of like the big picture things that make it work and make it so different from what I feel like is usually pitched as a strength training program. So you can hopefully grasp the direction that, it, that we're going here. Um, so first, as I said, you start with body weight movements, you build up to, that's like, you're not a great picture because it's from the side, but that's me with a barbell on my back and what are it called, plates. You start with no weight. I start with a Swiffer in the videos. I think I actually literally started with a Swiffer when I was practicing lifting in my little apartment in Brooklyn all of those years ago. Um, but you don't have to, it's coming back to the sort of Jalen Hurts principle of it all. It's, I don't think it's well understood that just because you can't lift heavy weights now doesn't mean you can't learn to move your body in that way. Um, per those avocado diagrams, your body is actually good at and designed to build muscle if you just give it the chance. And it's not some specialized skill. It may take some practice with these lifts in order to kind of get the movement pattern down, but as we saw, that's like a kind of an investment in your overall life when you are next shoveling snow, bringing the cat litter inside, carrying groceries, all of these things. It's kind of like the ABCs of body movement. Um, and a lot of people can't just hop in and do them because they have maybe bad movement habits from sitting too much or not moving enough. But those are things that are your body is able to change with a certain amount of uh, effort put into it. And it's not, I don't know, it's not something that is so uh, as off the beaten path as you would think. It's like, as a baby, you could probably do a squat. You can learn to do a squat again, almost certainly. And that will take you from not being at risk to having a back spasm when you pick something up off the floor to uh, having better movement patterns overall in your life. So. These are small pink dumbbells. Maybe you've seen them used in various strength training workouts. Um, maybe you've even been disappointed in the past that lifting the two pound dumbbells for lots and lots of reps didn't really do anything. And maybe you've heard that lifting heavy weights is what creates actual strength, but I'm gonna like explain this a little bit more. So I've hopefully created a contrast here between three sets of 30 reps with three sets of five reps for a 20 pound dumbbell, if that's like challenging for you. This is what we want. I think I thought that looked like a thumbs up at the time that I put it there. Okay, so here's a thought experiment. You picture a sheet of paper and imagine crumpling it up and uncrumpling it again. Just doing that for three sets of 30 reps, let's say. Uh, it's more ragged than before, but it's not like a lot of damage to it. That's kind of like what cardio does to your muscles. 
if you take that paper and just like stab a bunch of holes in it with a pencil, that's like creating a lot of damage much more quickly with like one tool. Uh, so the paper is now more mangled. You don't have to poke that many times, but that hole poking has given the paper opportunities to be repaired by better paper. If that makes sense. You can now introduce like thick, juicy cardstock sort of paste over the holes, and suddenly you have a somewhat stronger, in a sense, piece of paper. Um, so that's like not an amazing metaphor that I've always meant to come up with a better one, but like that's the broad, that's like the broad strokes difference between lifting small weights and lifting heavy weights. It's like heavy weights for a certain amount of intensity create a different kind of frankly muscle damage that can then be repaired. And that's the process at work when your muscles are getting structured. Um, and that's, it's still a pretty slow process. Even if you tried as hard as you possibly could, you probably could more than a few pounds of muscle in like a few months. Um, so it's not like, again, not, you don't become Arnold overnight. It takes a while, but it is just like the way that your body works. So um, compound movements is another sort of cornerstone of the way that lift off works. You might be used to a lot of small, what we call single joint movements. This is someone doing like a tricep extension. It's like, so you're working like basically one single muscle in your body when you do that. Um, what we want is something that is one of the compound movements described before, squat, bench, deadlift, row. These muscles use, or these movements use multiple muscles at the same time. And when you are practicing these movements, you're not only learning to strengthen some, like the biggest muscles in your body, you're teaching them to work all together. It's like a neurological adaptation and not just a muscle building adaptation. So that allows you to teach those muscles to work together, but you can also get stronger much faster because you're using all of these muscles together in a way that you are going to, again, move in everyday life. You can, for instance, move every individual muscle, like in your arms, you can do three sets of chest flies, bicep machine, curl machine, lateral raise, front raise, or you can just bench for three sets of five reps and then you can go home. It's like, what would you rather do? You probably would rather do movement that fewer reps, less time. Maybe the movement itself is a little bit more complicated, but you are creating a different kind of strength when you do that. There's like a material difference there. That's a green arrow so that you know that that's the good one. Okay. Um, another thing about liftoff is you are using what we call free weights, not machines. So here's a man on a Smith machine. You may have known this is a Smith machine. Uh, when I've heard, you know, I think most people don't know. I didn't know when I started lifting that this is not a squat rack. It is a Machine where there is a barbell that moves in a fixed track. This is different than when you are squatting again with a free weight on your back. In the real world, the stuff we pick up and move around, including our own body parts, if you're like moving your arm or your leg or whatever, uh, the they're not perfectly secured in the gliding track. When you use free weights, your body can learn to also stabilize itself. There are to learning to use the big muscles together. There are lots of little stabilizing muscles that you don't get to learn to use when you use something like the Smith machine or any of the other, you know, a leg press or whatever. That doesn't mean that machines don't have their place, but they just do a very different thing. They don't have the same offering that a free weight does. Um, these stabilizers include, if you've heard of your core, if you've seen core workouts, the supremacy of the core workout is another thing that bothers me very much, but um, <laughs> there's almost no better way to train your core than doing something like what we have on the right, if you can see that like, there's no way in which I couldn't be using my core in that process. So you just like, <laughs> don't need to train your core directly even when you're not, not to say you never need to train it, but like when you're doing something like this, you're doing a 
kind of training that's going to access those core muscles that everyone is so <laughs> interested in uh, working all of the time. Um, so next principle is what I call weights go up. This is also not the most graceful conception of things, but what you didn't know about a lot of the strength training workouts that you see, like a New York Times nine minute strength training workout, quote unquote, um, when I look at that, it tells you how many moves to do or which moves to do and how many reps to do and how many sets, uh, but it doesn't give you what you what we call a uh, progression. It doesn't tell you how to get stronger, how to like take those movements and, and build strength. You'll build a little bit of strength just by repeating them, but you can do so much more when you do what we call progressive overload or what I call weights go up. So when weights go up, you might be squatting 10 pound dumbbells this session, next session, you pick up the 15, 15 pound dumbbells and you squat those. I think when I started, before I learned about strength training, I didn't know that that was possible or sort of like, that's what the sort of, we go to a gym and they have like a full rack of dumbbells. I was just like, okay, the small ones are for me because I can't do anything. And then the big ones are for the strong people. The real reason they're like that is because <laughs> you can do this. You can go from, you can work your way from using small dumbbells, to using big dumbbells, to using barbell, to adding plates on your barbell. And that is, again, just something that your body will allow you to do. You do need to like take care of the other cornerstones of lifting that we're going to get to in a second. But this is a very, I found this to be a very gratifying feedback loop to be able to go into the gym and lift new heavier weights every time without any sort of particular like talent for this. It just sort of happened in a way that was very magical. Um, and I think a lot of people can't, don't think that they can do that. And it's very, I think it changes way that you think about your body when you realize you can do something like this. And I don't know why no one talks about this, the sort of trajectory that's possible here, but who knows? Not for me to solve. Okay, so the next principle that matters related to building muscle is you need to rest. Um, you can't be going around running too much or getting even too stressed out. Um, outside of your training sessions. When you're not training, you need to give your muscles time. You need to be sleepy time, celestial seasonings there, just in your chair. You don't have to, you know, it's not gentle, but like you need to give yourself time to rest because that's actually how your muscles get stronger. They rebuild when they're not working. You create that damage, the, the sort of pencil full poking damage. And then when you're resting, your body takes the fuel that you give it and it has time to rebuild those muscles, to refuel your muscles for the next training session. Um, this can take up to 72 hours, but the reason that lift off is programmed so that you're only lifting three days a week is because you need that you need that time. If you worked out more than more than that, a lot more than that, um, you're kind of sapping the entire point of what you're doing. So Another reason that I liked lifting and that is sort of the rest of it was enforced and like protected and valued. And that's, um, I, you know, cherish that about lift off, I guess. Okay. So I think the last principle that I have here is the importance of eating. Um, I can't say how many times I've gone on Reddit, just like wanting to enjoy myself and I find someone who's in the specifically women's fitness subreddit who is like my lifting progress is just like totally stalled I can't figure out what's wrong um I'm working out five days a week and here's the workouts I do and I'm sleeping and I just don't know what it is and everyone's jumping in the comments like have you tried cold plunges have you tried taking fish oil and no one's like are you eating anything you need to this is so like, no foods are bad foods, but this is not breakfast. This is breakfast. This is breakfast. Oh, I didn't mean to go that far. But uh, 
you need to, you need your protein. Protein is what muscles are made of. Um, so that's a tricky part of it. I hear from a lot of people who are like, I can't possibly eat as much protein as I am supposed to. But as we'll get to in a second, I think you just saw, it's not a forever thing. When you're trying to rebuild muscle, you do need a lot of protein, but it's like you're trying to do a specific thing. You're trying to like give your body muscle back. But you do also need your carbs. You need your fats. You need all of these things. Like all of these things work together in ways that we barely understand. <laughs> and you need your fuel when you're lifting. When I started lifting, I was eating fully 50% more than I had been when I was dieting. And when I realized that I had to eat that much more, I couldn't believe it. I like I accepted on pure faith that, that was going to work and not sort of ruin my life, undo all of the hard work that I had been doing for several years. Um, but it really does work that way. And I can't, you know, it feels like the only ways of proving that are becoming problematic, but just like, I don't see this emphasized enough, even in communities where um, the maybe life balance aspect of lifting is emphasized, but this is a huge part of lift off. It's like my ability to give advice there is a little limited because I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, but I can tell you that most people probably aren't eating enough when they're lifting. Uh, so ultimately, how long do you have to do this for? Not forever. Um, so lift off is designed to be 12 weeks. Um, that's kind of as long as I think, or it's, it's the sort of minimum effective dose, I would say, for how long it takes, how long it takes me to feel comfortable, I guess, that you gave lifting a fair shot, that you had given yourself space to try and build some strength, to try and eat accordingly, to like get into the gym and get comfortable with the equipment and the overall process of it. Um, but in that time, you can build some real strength. Like when I was in those videos, you know, lifting the um, lifting the cat litter, shoveling the snow, I wasn't lifting more than like 40 pounds. You can get there in a few months. You don't have to. This is not like a moral imperative. But you can get stronger so much more quickly and straightforwardly in a way that is helpful to your overall life. And then that's that can be kind of your entire relationship with it. You can get a lot stronger, sort of depending on your genetic ability, your interest in like really crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's of doing the programming. Um, but it's not, there's not like one of these is not better. It's just sort of meant to show the range of where you can land. And you might not think that you can get that much stronger, but <laughs> give it a chance. You'll probably end up somewhere between between those two in a matter of months. And um, to me, it's magical. I don't know. Um, so after you do lift off and you just walk off into the sunset, that's like, you know, fine with me. I think the other one of the other problems, so to speak, with strength training is that a lot of people perceive it as this like thing that they have to be obsessed with for the rest of their life if they're going to even start doing it. But you can have the relationship that you want with it as long as you promise me personally that you'll do it for at least three months. Um, but I think we see like bro, gym bros who are obsessed with lifting. Um, and we think that we have to get to that level in order to be allowed to do it at all. You can have a much more functionality relationship with lifting than I think many people think, and there's so much meaning you can find in a, even just a casual relationship with lifting to learn that you can grow in that way. And if you don't normally work out, you can do a program like this and go back to living your life. And one of the really cool things about strength training is that um, it never really goes away. You're never, it's never going to be as difficult for you to rebuild that strength as it was the first time. So even if do it, stop strength training, you never strength train again for like several years, you come back to it, you decide you want to be strong again. It will be easier for you to get stronger 
again than it was that first time. So it's like your body, the fact that your body like retains that, that meaning that there's always going to be, there's so, what are my senses here? There will always have been <laughs> meaning to the months that you do strength training, something along those lines. Um, so it's like, I think that's another element that is lost with working out. We think of, we think of exercise as just like a slog that we do forever, but you can turn exercise into training and sort of build something material that you have to an extent for the rest of your life. Um, you can also, if you do another sport, take a break from it, do a program like this, go back to your sport with like all of these new skills that you've built and you may find that you have a different relationship to it or feels feels differently, <laughs> hopefully feels better. Um, so that's it. Um, I think all of all that I have to say about it. If you are interested in, in lift off and something like this, again, we have the website here. And um, yeah, now I take questions. <laughs> we need tech. So we have time for, uh, we have time for some questions. So if you'd like to raise your hand and I can bring you the microphone, you can ask Casey some questions uh, about anything that we covered here. Does anybody want to go first? First question is always the most intimidating. I feel like I'm scooching closer to you. Hello. Uh, I just Hi. have a question about, you know, seeing your pictures is where did you start your muscle couch to barbell? Were you at a, at a um, gym? Were you at your house? Where'd you get the material? If you were at home, what's kind of your tips for like starters? And, you know, like you said, you don't want to go to the environment where you feel like there's, you know, the, the experienced people that might, you know, impact you. But like, where do you suggest? Where did you start? Where do you suggest others to start as well? <laughs> do you mean like physically, like yeah. what gym? Like, did you go to a gym? Did okay. you go to home? Was there certain types of places you felt were more welcoming to this yeah. mindset? And then kind of your progression to, you know, owning barbells at home, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your house. Um, that's a good question. So I really started patching things together from like the internet and practicing in my house, like really not that dissimilar to lift off. Um, I made liftoff because I didn't know of anything that, like, I had to kind of Frankenstein together this, like, body weight practice, and then a lot of the strength training programs that I could find were just like, here's how you get started with a barbell, and I was like, I can't lift half of a barbell for most of these movements. Um, so, in a way, I started at home with some instruction videos and a Swiffer. <laughs> um, and then part of the reason that this came together to me, I will say, or for me, I'll say, is um, I lived at the time around the corner from a gym that did happen to have everything I needed, but it was a place called uh, Richie's Gym that was like a black iron, just like disgusting, weights on the floor everywhere, the loudest music, just like guys, I think it was a firehouse around the side, the other side of that block. So just massive guys with like tons of free time, all screaming at each other um, <laughs> as they did curls and they bench and all of this stuff. So it was like, I think a real trial by fire in that sense. I was very scared. I was very worried I would be, you know, accosted whether with good intent or bad intent, simply like identifying me as someone who didn't know what I was doing. Um, and that did happen a couple of times, but I, you just kind of like shrug them off. And I don't mean to make light of it. It is like a whole adjustment process. You have a good, I don't know how to get it to you. I think it's called how to get started with the gym, a series of, um, she's a beast. I don't know why I did this. And they're like, my newsletter, she's a beast. I have a series of columns that's sort of like how to get your feet wet with like going to a new gym. And this is honestly a process that I still go through because I've been kind of like moving around a lot in the last year. So when you go to a new gym, it's kind of a high expectation to set that you can walk in and just like do a workout. You, it's like helpful to break it down into like, okay, I'm just gonna go in to this new gym and like post up somewhere on like a treadmill, wherever you can like see the whole gym and just like watch move around. 
And then you can kind of like graduate to the next step of like, okay, I'm going to like get the equipment set up that I need, but like not actually do work. I'll just kind of like get everything together, get to the point that I could actually do the sets and things that I want, but I'm not going to actually do them. I'm just going to get in the rep, so to speak, of like claiming the spot rock, something like that. Um, so I think it can be helpful to break it down in that way and sort of honor the process of it being a little intimidating. It's like going anywhere, you're not going to know where stuff is and you're going to feel like the new the new kid, the new kid at school, the new kid at your job. Um, and it's good to give yourself room to just let that be its own process, I would say. Any other questions? Hi. Um, I am wondering, given the context of what you showed for 2008 to 2000, whatever, um, tips for doing your first cut mm -hmm. while trying to forget about the history of dieting mm -hmm. and trying to be smaller, et cetera. That's a good question. I think that I was sort of as... I was intimidated by the process of, so I bulked first. I think that's an important thing to say. And I had my own kind of like mental process about that, where it was like the idea of gaining weight with intention was so anathema to me having gone through all of that. Um, but I had to kind of do a little kind of interviewing of myself and being like, do I want to get stronger? Yes. Okay. That's what I have to do. Um, the cutting part, I think I was moved, or I think I, what helped me a lot in thinking about it. I mean, I think it just helped that by that time I had been strength training for a few years and I was like protective of, of that process and those results. And I, I had been kind of, I had really reoriented a lot of things about the way I thought about all of this stuff. I see a lot of <laughs> to bring it back to Reddit, see a lot of women hopping on and being like, I want to start lifting. Should I bulk or cut first? And a lot of women are like, oh, it depends on what you want to do. It's like, don't probably don't cut first unless like a doctor recommends that or something, because it's just like, it can't, it, I think it could be confusing to some people with that background. Um, but what helped me was thinking about it in the way of, I was trying to eat as much as possible while still losing body fat in order to get back to that place of being able to bulk again, basically. I wasn't trying to look a particular way as much as I was trying to get back to a place where I could continue to build more strength. And I honestly didn't, cutting is hard because like you do lose, you lose some strength and that was like hard to deal with. Um, but I think tried to keep my focus around like this is all in service of like continuing to get stronger and continuing to be able to lift, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, so cutting. <laughs> it's like, see, it's like some, I would say like, it's, I think I wrote a whole newsletter about it where I was like, this is advanced special topics and lifting. Like I would not concern yourself with it if you're just kind of like, getting your feet wet with this stuff. But generally it means the process of once you have bulked, which means you have eaten more food, a surplus of food, you've lifted weights, you've built a lot of strength, you've gained muscle, but also gained a little bit of body fat in the process. When you cut, you're trying to lose some of the body fat that you gained in order to gain that muscle while hanging on to the muscle. And then that brings you to, a, at least me, brings to, brings me back to a place where I can then bulk again and build muscle and, and gain weight again. Does that make sense? You don't. You do gain weight. You bulk. You, when you gain weight, you bulk. When you bulk, you gain weight. When you bulk, you are gaining fat. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's a lot to take in. That's why I'm like, kind of don't, I'm like, don't worry about that part with you. just, you know, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I appreciate it. It's very rich to hear a young woman come out and talk about these things that are so closeted. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. That's nice. Oh, you're the guy. <laughs> 
<laughs> we have time for a couple more. Thank you for coming to Michigan, first of all. Um, I was just curious how you feel about the scale and weighing yourself. Do you prefer to see how your clothes fit or do you find the scale to, you know, not trigger any potential like weird uh, eating? There's a more of a tool for you at this point since you're pretty comfortable where you are. Yeah. I mean, I think it's worth I don't think anyone needs to feel how I feel, which is like many people find those numbers like triggering forever. And they like mentally speaking should not weigh themselves and shouldn't count calories and shouldn't like, you know, deal with that aspect of, of lifting. For me, I found it like very grounding, real world feedback when I started lifting to see that that recomposition process was working as I had heard that it would, where I was not like beyond the like certain initial fluctuation in body weight. It's like your body adjusting to new working out. Um, that my body weight was not just like shooting off into the moon. <laughs> so I started eating more food. Um, because I mean, like my mom still believes that, that that's what's gonna happen if she if she eats more. Um, <laughs> nothing I say can like convince her that otherwise, but so it was like valuable, like objective data for me to see that, like that didn't happen. Um, so that's not going to be everyone's circumstance and that's like, totally okay. Um, but I always, I, I always found that stuff more helpful than not. Anyone else? What are your opinions on the hip thrust? <laughs> <laughs> are you asking me this because you know what I'm going to say? Or are you genuinely curious? Oh, no. So, no, it wasn't. I think this is becoming a thing, isn't it? This hip thrust. Um, so. Do you want to explain what, what the hip thrust is? I don't know if I can explain. It's like a the the library power rack, rack is not here. Our, our barbells are at a different program right now. Mobile, so. Right. I know it's like almost like I could show you more easily than it would be to explain it, but I don't want it. He's like shaking his head. I, I don't want to do that. Sorry, um, public library. It's a it's a lift where you're kind of like crouched on the floor on your butt and you have a weight across your lap and you like are lifting it <laughs> into the air. It's like a pretty short range. Um, I think it's technically a single joint movement. Um, it's gotten very popular because it's like a way to make your butt bigger is usually how it's sold. That's not incorrect. Um, it's it's a good movement because it is, I believe, like kind of there's nothing there's nothing exactly like it, but that's true of a lot of lifts. It's like it does stimulate that joint and that set of muscles in a particular way. I but I don't really do them <laughs> if that like if that informs me at all. Um, I actually, when I do them, I prefer to do them on a machine because they're so annoying to set up. You have to like, you know, um, wedge a barbell again or wedge a bench against a wall, sit down next to the bench, like bring a barbell over, load the barbell with all like everything on the floor. It's just like a lot of work. There's machines that will allow you to do a hip thrust where you just kind of like buckle a seat in your lap and you go. Um, I actually found, no one, few people want to hear this, that, um, for that joint or style of movement, I like uh, our Romanian deadlift variations a lot better. Um, both, you know, you can do barbells, dumbbells, B stance. I like those better. And I think they're like easier to do. And I've gotten a lot better results out of them than I get it for us. So, yeah. All right, we'll do one more after this. Um, I have a thought and a question. My thought is that if you're looking to get into the gym, the other thing that is, can be really helpful is a personal trainer. Oh, yeah. And there might be lots of personal trainers in this room, but I can vouch personally for the lady up there in the braids. <laughs> it's Monica. Um, and 
So that's super helpful if you just need someone to like kind of shepherd you through the process. Um, and my question though is in a like kind of commercial mainstream gym, do you have advice for um, holding your own space? Like, are you friendly? Do you make eye contact? Do you smile or do you do the death glare or do you talk to people who are on their phones? Do you ask how many reps they have left or how many sets? Or do you just stand and stare at them? This has been a thing for me recently. Okay. Well, at first I was sort of interpreting you as like, do I feel like I get like approached or like bothered a lot by people? But I feel like if you're picking up on my affect, it's like, I am very like, I think I give off a real like, don't approach me vibe. Um, but in terms of asserting myself, like trying to get equipment, um, that was like something I really had to do work to get over and again be like okay what i want i want to do squats if i want to do squats i have to like ask the guy if he's going to be done anytime soon otherwise everyone's you know all the other squat racks are being used like i have to do something so yeah like i think what's important to keep in mind is that that feels like the biggest imposition you can make on somebody because like you've never seen or been in that interaction before but it's a very normal interaction, especially in a gym where there's like two squat racks or one squat squat rack, you know, like many gyms have very limited squat or anything, equipment, any lifting equipment. That's changing a lot, but it is still, I think it is getting more in demand recently. Um, so yes, when it when I was in that situation, which I'm grateful not anymore, but like for several years when I was going to Richie's gym, they had two three in one power rack and two squat racks so it was a lot of like how many sets do you have left okay <laughs> if you're you know you have two sets or whatever um my process would then be to say like usually point in a direction and be like i'm going to be over here warming up or like you know doing my either doing my specific warm-ups or stretching or whatever or i would just like stand nearby you want to strike a balance between being on top of them if they're being like annoying about it to like being within eye within viewing distance so that when they're done they can kind of like flag you down and get you back over there but yeah i think it's like something that you might feel like a a jerk for doing it but you're not it's like a very a very like i can't stress enough normal gym interaction especially in gym where there's like high traffic on that equipment Final question. I was wondering if you would speak to, I guess, like loathing exercise and like exercising yourself away to really enjoying it. And I guess like that process for you, like what changed? What was, what were the drivers for that? That's a good question. I think the, the big thing for me I think there were a lot of conflating factors. I mean, this is why it's like, it's going to be probably like literally two years till it's out, but like, this is what my next book will dive deeply into is that whole thing. But I think sort of the external factors aside, I was just, I got to a point where I was just like really dissatisfied with what I was getting out of running and dieting, which was like, I felt like I had been promised something and it was just like never, not only never arriving, but only getting worse in the sense of like, I felt like I had to run more and more and eat less and less in order to just stay where I was. And then I was like, when I learned that that was like, not just my imagination or my lack of discipline, but like just literally biologically true, I was very upset. <laughs> um, so that was really, it was that I think I had just reached a breaking point with the process of it and was willing to try something else. Um, and I also wrote about this, I wrote a piece for the cut that I believe the title is, I didn't start lifting weights because I wanted to be strong, but I did find some, I found like a lifting, again, here comes Reddit, subreddit where um, someone had posted about her lifting process and posted her before and after pictures. I was like, you know, she's not, I forget if she was like really skinnier, but she was like, 
she was getting the results that I always wanted out of working out. And I was just like, and she, but she was eating so much more, <laughs> working out so much less. And I was just like, what the hell is the deal with me not knowing about this? Even though, like I'm in the exercise, I had been before. It's like no one had ever kind of like introduced me to any of this. So that was a part of it too, where I did see somebody where it was like, you can at least like um, get the, get something like what you've always wanted, but maybe even more to the point, lifting is not going to do what you're afraid it's going to do, which is like make you huge all of a sudden or have to be your entire personality or be something that's like extremely way more difficult than the running that I was doing. So I just did also stumble on some information that allowed me to fall backward into all of this other very gratifying, rewarding elements of, of lifting. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You can visit ADL.org for more. You can visit ADL.org for more uh, upcoming events. And in two more years, I'll host another one. <laughs> Join me here. Uh, have a great night. Thanks for coming.